I am tempted to give you as an example of a typical approach of this sort. A man who came to see me, I was in a fourth floor, living in a fourth floor flat apartment. And this man came to see me and said, I, I'll do anything, take me on, I'll be your disciple, I'll kill my wife and child and all that. And I said, well, never mind. Uh, <laughs> What do you want to do? He said, I want to obey. And I said, do you want to submit? And he said, yes, yes. And so I said to him, well, do you know how to obey? And he said, absolutely. There's one thing I know, it's how to obey. I've tried everything. I've been a used car salesman. I've been a this, I've been a that. But what I really know is how to obey. So I said, fine. All right, then just uh, jump through the window, fourth floor. So he looked at me, and I, I was simply, I mean, you can see what I look like. People call me a mafioso or something, because when I am not laughing, I'm not a pretty face, as they say. <laughs> so I simply looked back at him. So he went to the window, you see, and he started to pull it up, the bottom part of the window. And he had a kind of funny look in his face, as if he was going to throw himself out. So I reckoned, first, that, um, all right, he knows how to obey. Uh, but also, we've got to get the commercial in, haven't we, somehow. We have to make this situation instructive in some way. And not only instructive, but instructive in a manner which he will digest. Because whether I ever see him again or not, I must leave him with something. He must leave me with something that he didn't have before. Otherwise, I am not carrying out my job. So I said, stop. And he stopped. Oh. <laughs> and I let it go, one, two, three, and I suddenly saw, as any one of you could with sort of amateur psychotherapeuty, we're all amateur psychotherapists these days, I began to see, passing over the musculature of his face, as we say in the trade, <laughs> A sort of thing I didn't like. In fact, he was saying to me, body language or face language, saying, you didn't dare. Because he suddenly, everything started to work, and that nasty little thing, which we call the commanding self, Nafsi Amara, in him, which is the conditioned, come, primitive animal brain, was reasserting itself. You see, this human will in its rather less attractive form. So I could see, he was thinking, oh, well, there you are, you see, so much for that. So he was preparing to say, of course, uh, well, I knew you were only testing me, sort of thing. And then he said, well, did I pass the test? And I said, no, you failed. But he said, did you, did you expect me to jump through when you said stop? And I said, I said, jump through the window, not open the window and jump out of the window. <laughs> now, this is a man who knew how to obey, remember. Now, this is an absolutely true story, as it happens, but it's come into my mind, it's popped up into my mind to tell you, as an illustration of uh, not how are we going to teach people, but how are they going to let us teach them. They're not even literal-minded <laughs> when it comes down to it, let alone curiously metaphysically-minded. And this is my everyday experience. So people who are interested in this sort of subject, if they're not interested in it in the sort of sense in which we are trying to introduce it into the main stream of psychology and uh, so on, or at least make its contribution visible in this mainstream as a substitute for uh, going into conniptions or whatever you call it, doing sort of circus things, people who are interested in it in this sort of way will never be able to harmonize with our current projection of this material at all. That's because they take the Sufi phenomenon to be cultural in the sense of some kind of a charade, as it's called, some kind of a dumb show, some sort of a game, some sort of a substitute for a family, some sort of a cultural phenomenon where we play games. Now, I think games are marvelous, but I know, I think, when I'm playing a game and when I'm not. So there is this difficulty of communication. Not only what is there to communicate, what are we communicating 
uh, with, to whom are we communicating, and how are we communicating, and how can they understand it? We have been able to solve this problem where it has been solved only by intense specialization and sophistication. There is no brief theory of Sufism. Every single one of the past and present authorities on the subject, those who publish on this subject, has been challenged, especially the Sufi teachers of the past, classical ones, by uh, academic and other authorities, and not being a Sufi at all, or not being a classical Sufi, or not being a spiritual Sufi, but being a literary Sufi. So, if we put them up on the wall and tick them off, we could put a list of a hundred famous Sufis, and then we could put footnotes showing which a respected academic would not admit them into the list of Sufis, and we soon find we don't have any Sufis at all. And that could, might be worth a PhD, perhaps, but nothing else. Now, there are a lot of Sufi classics, but there are no standard books in the sense that you must learn from this and not from that, because Sufi books are designed, apart from their cultural coloring, like Sufi practices, to fit in with transient circumstances. And as for the rest, you can go back to my 14th century Oriental that you can turn yourself into. So the object of Sufism, in spite of the hilarity which even my uh, standing up here uh, seems to provoke, is to be a nutrient and not to provide entertainment. Although, in the absence of being able to fulfill the one role, I am delighted to fulfill the other. So Sufism doesn't promise you anything either. I'm answering the question, list of questions here. It um, has no time scale of uh, study. It hasn't got a system of paying, really, although it, it hasn't got a, so much a week or so much a meeting or whatever, but it has got a method of paying which is understood in various ways, mainly, in my experience, in the, as rather like the... Spanish proverb you probably all know, which is um, Tome lo que quieres, dijo Dios, sino pagalo. It's take what you like, says God, but pay for it. That's the kind of payment. But the first requirement of a person who wishes to become a Sufi, if he really does, is to be flexible in his approach to Sufism and to all sorts of other things. Not negative, but he must be versatile, he must be able to be flexible. It is one of the reasons why we set so much store by humor. Because in your own experience you'll see, people who don't laugh or can't laugh tend to be less flexible than people who can and do. The people who laugh seem to be less threatened. People who are uptight, if that, I think it's your word. It's more difficult for them to laugh. One can predict a person's capacity for understanding things in Sufism by the degree to which he is um, able not to be serious, as well as the degree to which he is serious and can be serious. So now, from this point, you must laugh at almost anything <laughs> I say. If you have difficulty, I will raise my arm and tell you. <laughs> Mind you, and this has nothing to do with my subject, but I feel I must tell you about it. <laughs> All right, I'll, as you are, I'll tell you the truth. I have twins, a boy and a girl of nine years old. And when they knew I was coming to America, they said, what do you want to do there? I said, I want to talk to a lot of people and all that. So they said, well, will you tell them all about Grandpa and the joke, you see? So I promised to tell them. I promised to tell you, so I must do it. It fits in somewhat with my theme about... <laughs> Perhaps more holistically than sequentially, but... It fits in. When I was hoping to marry my wife, the woman who is now my wife, I had to go and see her father. And she told him all about me, as the saying goes, step, which means, of course, whatever she told him. And he said to me, the first thing he said, the door opened, there he was, and I was, didn't have time to even sort of prove there I was, and he said, I hear you're a very funny man. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, so, so I understand my uh, people just, and he said, all right, then say something funny. 
is perfectly true. But I promised the twins to tell you, so now I have. I recommend the books which have been written on Sufism by Sufis, and even the books which have been written by experts in the field. <laughs> even if only you are able by reading them to see just what can happen when people become experts in the field. <laughs> and how many experts there can be. Of course, when you've worked through the books, you'll see, particularly the ones that are now pouring out of the presses by some people who were rather less than cordial about me, although I've given them a great market. Uh, there wasn't that market for Sufi books before. You will see that, um, it, it, that you will be left in a slightly similar position to the legendary small boy who pulled this um, fly to pieces, and he found, when he pulled it to pieces, that he only had a body and legs and wings and couldn't find the fly. Of all that all those accretions, you will find what Sufism is, and you will be able to prepare yourselves for what it can give. Aside from what it can feed into the existing institutions to which I referred before. Now that's one positive contribution, that's one thing which one can do to understand about it. It's not that difficult. The only thing which would prevent that difficulty is selective reading and selective registering of arguments only these arguments and not others, from those books. You will find, of course, by reading these books, that the Sufi things like, uh, not only that the great masters were or were not Sufis, not, but also that the Sufis originated in, in Greece, in Spain, in India, in any way you like, uh, that they are Muslims, that they're not Muslims, that they're Sunnis, that they're Shias, that they are secret Christians, and so on. We prefer to simplify it, call it reductionism, we say they're Sufis. In fact, there is a, an entry in a Persian dictionary which is rhymed and it says, Sufi chist, Sufi Sufist. What is a Sufi? A Sufi is a Sufi. And that goes back to about 500 years ago. So, Sufism is not studied by means of the superficialities of its apparent history, of its apparent literature, of its so-called masters and so on, but the Sufi methods, the Sufi flavor, the Sufi perceptions are to be obtained and benefit is to be derived from them by familiarizing oneself with what has been written. I would go so far as to say that what I have published and what I will continue to publish and my associates too will give you that anyway that you don't need to read anybody else's stuff. But I am not going to say that. <laughs> For two very good reasons, or three very good reasons. One, that if I said it, you might think the worse of me. Two, because I'm already selling enough copies to keep a roof over my head, which is a requirement of my uh, Sufi commitment. I must earn my, my bread. And three, because I would like to, believe it or not, make things clearer for you. I don't want to leave something unexamined. I don't want you to, I want, don't want to say, you read my books, they give you everything, and to have you think, you wake up at night and think, I wonder what Nicholson, Arbery, Guillaume, X, Y, and Z say about it. Why doesn't he want us to read their stuff? No, I want you to read that stuff. People write articles about me, of course. No doubt you all have the same experience, but they tend to write about things that they think will amuse the readers. You know, they have to keep the show on the road. And one thing which I did has been regarded as very remarkable by people. It's gone into the press clippings morgues all over the world, and they trot it out regularly, among other things that they write about me. Now there's a sort of distillate of all these articles, and um, since the writers rehash the more remarkable things, supposedly, and since they exaggerate them a bit each time, I'm coming out more and more fantastic day by day. But one of the things which re people regarded as quite astonishing, I submit, is a perfectly ordinary, simple, normal, and valuable thing to do. I had various adverse reviews which were written about me, and I circulated them very widely to scholars so that they would be able to have an impression of what was being said about me. And this, people began to think that I was some kind of a lunatic, giving currency to other people's irresponsible work, or that I was uh, a monomaniac because just because my name was on it, I had to have it out. They didn't realize that it's more likely if you circulate all the information about a subject, and if, you're, if you know your information to be good, that the fallacious information 
fed in will only support you and your case by contrast. And yet, such a simple action as that was misinterpreted and has gone into the literature. At the very lowest, they say it's what they call lifemanship. This man's doing some kind of a judo. Somebody writes an article against him and he immediately sends it all around everywhere and people think he must be what they call bomb-proof. Uh, he must be, be so sure of himself that he will even give a platform to his enemies sort of thing. Not so. It is that if what we are doing is legitimate, then you can only benefit by familiarizing yourself with all the material in the field. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. So that's the other thing people can do. Furthermore, there's an enormous amount of, of work now being done relating Sufi contributions in literature and psychology, in science even, to the concerns of the present day, sociology and so on. A lot of this is being published and hasn't been written by me, and that is going to be the foundation, the reference material, from which we work rather than uh, poetic classics or didactic material or religious conversion material. We are going to work from a power base, as it were, of reasonable material which is acceptable in your sort of terms. This is the way in which we can introduce our subject to you and enable you to learn more about it. Now, in doing this, we have to continue this clearing the ground business because it isn't being done sufficiently. There is no teaching or training in how to think straight or why if somebody says jump through the window you don't or why, or why you try to open it inst instead. This automatic thinking is very much a feature, automatistic thinking and so on, of Western people, which includes people like me who have a Western veneer or whatever you might care to call it. Now, innumerable cases of this. So, for instance, an, a book called The Elephant in the Dark came out. A uh, celebrated scholar recently uh, reviewed this. And all he did in his review was to um, criticize the fact that this title, which is the title of a story found in Jalali Rumi's Masnavi, that this title had not been ascribed to traditions other than Sufism in which it also occurs. The whole content, the meaning of the story, the reason why the title was invoked, none of this was of any interest to him. The only thing that was of interest to him was that these things had not been mentioned. It's as if somebody were to write a thesis on fluoride in water or something, and somebody reviews this by saying, well, what about the water of Patagonia that wasn't mentioned in... And this is done in a serious academic journal, the 600 words, which is you know, it's quite clever endurance to keep up, 600 words on why it, it is strange that the author has not seen his way clear to uh, mentioning that this material has in fact been used in traditions other than, uh, connections other than those in which he uh, feels it necessary for some unknown reason to, 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 to work and so on. This situation is not confined to the West or to our time, of course. Now, I would also like to make another thing clear, or with some care. It might interest you to know that all these things I'm complaining about under the guise of clearing the air or getting rid of the brushwood, which, which some of my uh, opponents or even well-wishers would consider uh, just a disguise for uh, being difficult, uh, these these attitudes that I'm complaining about, these shortcomings in our training and background and way of thinking and so on, may be common, but they are not invariable or unanimous. That is to say, I can find a, an audience, believe it or not, um, in which a reasonable percentage, if not quantity, of the people uh, do not have these disabilities or even from feedback from our books. We publish books and we get a lot of people asking for the neighborhood and franchise Sufi teacher, but a lot of people don't. It's not only lunatics who, who, who write, or mostly, to people who write books, uh, but some people actually see what we mean. Some people don't have to ask the sort of questions that um, betrays, or displays, better word, the um, sort of standard reactions that I am complaining about. And this really is the only saving grace. I mean, if I, if I had to say everybody's out of step except me, nobody understands it, then of course it would be very difficult. But luckily, 
there is a, a reasonably large proportion of people who do not, although they've been living in this culture, they are innocent of its worst ravages, as it seems from our point of view. Now, this I find very interesting, instructive, and not to say perplexing, because, but I suppose it, it is really well worth remembering. But where are these people to be found? Now, I'm telling you what interests me. They are to be found much more in the general populace, not so much in specialists. That is, they people who have got strong religiously um, emotional commitments and people who have a strong mechanical, academic type commitments, way of thinking, uh, these two extremes, as I call them, intellectual and emotional, as you might say, these people uh, display to a far greater extent the obscurantist behavior which I have been deploring. Whereas Mrs. Jones, who comes in and cleans the house three times a week, can understand straight away very often what one means by something published in a book by penguins and not yet adopted in the university curriculum. And that's, that's very interesting. My wife she says, well, you're just using long words to say common sense. Some people have common sense, others haven't. Well, if you like. Now, I prefer to believe this, that the reason for it is that the scholarly enterprise and the emotional enterprise, that is to say people who are working in literature and scholarship and those people who prefer to excite themselves and depress themselves by cultish behavior, these things are things from which satisfactions can be derived. The people who are working in these areas are deriving satisfaction from these areas. So they ask you mechanical-based questions or scholarly-based questions, and if you can't answer them in their form, they are obscurantists, as it were, because they are obtaining their satisfactions from the asking and answering of those kind of questions. They're not going to abandon their only source of satisfactions. Similarly, with the people who come and say things like, can you teach me a spiritual exercise? I know all sorts already, and I do a bit of mantrams, and I do a little bit of whirling and jumping, and I've got secret this and that, but I feel I haven't quite got deep enough. Well, they want to add this uh, another means of turning themselves on, and this is their kick. This is where they get their satisfactions from. So if you want to try to say to them something like, well, first things first, I want you to learn this, I want you to forget that, I want you to do something else, they won't do it. Now, this is why Mrs. Jones, who comes in twice a week to clean the house, uh, who is not committed, as it were, and hasn't got one of these well-established sources of satisfaction, is able to exercise common sense. Not really very long ago, a man came to the house and he was kind of roaring and jumping about and everything, and, uh, you know, and um, he brushed me aside, screaming, and answered the door, screaming that he wanted to see this man, Shah, or something. Finally, I managed to convince him that it was me, so he sort of herded me into my study and sat me down and told me all about the Masnavi of Jalaluddin Rumi that he had been studying for years and how it gave him spiritual fulfillment and how marvelous it was and what a wonderful book it was and he wanted to be a Sufi and this and that. Now, he was telling me uh, with remarkable skill and uh, energy. And then he asked me, when he sort of cooled down a bit, what I could do for him, sort of thing. And I said, that is a remarkable book. And that, that book, Master Jalal Rumi, is, to my mind, perhaps the most remarkable uh, human product, uh, book-wise, that there is. But if you want to understand more about Sufism, you must leave it aside. And of course, what did he say? He said, why? That, he said, you don't understand. That book, I live by that book. I will die by that book. That is the book which brought spirituality into my life. That is the book which gave meaning to my life. This is the book which prevented me from committing suicide. This is the book which has opened doors and so on for me. I said, very well. And he said, this is the book that's brought me to your door. And you say, throw it out. So I said to him, if you rode a donkey up to the front door, would you ride it into my room? You'd leave it outside, wouldn't you? It brought you. It's the vehicle which brought you. And he said, before he left, which was very soon afterwards, <laughs> I will not stay under the same roof as a man who calls Jalaluddin Rumi a donkey. 
the search for truth, the desire to learn about Sufism or how to be a Sufi or what it can contribute is subordinated by such people to their existing stimuli, their source of stimulation. Now, it is classically established among Sufis that there is a difference between learning and stimulation. There's a famous, very, very famous case uh, described by um, Al-Ghazali when a man went to his Sufi teacher and asked him for permission to engage in the hearing of music, whether he should hear music or not be allowed to listen to music, because music is held by Sufis to contain stimuli which act in different ways upon different people according to various considerations, what your condition is. And this Sufi said to him, yes, you may listen to, to any music, but you must do something else first. You must fast for ten days, eat nothing, drink nothing. Then you must have a delicious meal cooked. And then, if you prefer to hear the music, go and hear the music, but if you prefer to eat the food, eat the food and do not go near the music. Now this is an absolute standard thing among Sufis. In fact, that's how you can tell a Sufi from a, somebody who may not be a Sufi, that a Sufi is constantly and thoroughly aware, it's his profession in fact, uh, of this question of are you getting a stimulus from something or are you learning from it? And how much or how little stimulus ingredient is there in a thing? In the West, it's not customary to honor this principle at all, although, of course, in fact, it uh, does happen. I mean, if you get um, pleasure out of driving a train, you can become a train driver, but you, uh, you're unsuitable for driving the train if you insist on driving it 24 hours, day and night at a time. You mustn't do the thing too much. You mustn't get too much job satisfaction, any more than too little. And this is very well established in the Sufi learning process. I have found that there are people who, who do understand this very much, and I am quite sure that in spiritual teachings which require abstinence and repentance, this sort of abstinence, the ability to deny yourself things or to live without something which is a stimulus, is as much as it's a virtue, it's also a training. And that is also standard among Sufis who maintain a teaching system, as distinct from those who maintain a, a stimulus system. I mean, Sufi materials may have cultural attractiveness, they may contain information, Sufi situations, but this is not their chief purpose. Their chief purpose is developmental, it's the nearest I can put it in the language which I'm trying to speak at the moment. I'm going to give you some more information about Sufis, so that you can check this with what you may have heard about them, or what you come to know about them. First, I'm going to tell you how a Sufi explains the kind of path which he's organizing, the kind of learning system which he's organizing, and the way in which this learning system exists in almost all communities which have similar institutions. And on the whole, the say, Middle Eastern and the Western uh, civilizations or cultures have very similar or comparable institutions. Now, generally speaking, the traditional way of the Sufis using their terminology and phraseology to describe their product, because we have to start somewhere, is they talk of the Sufi as the insan kamil, insan al-kamil in Arabic, the perfected man or woman, uh, the completed human being, literally, always translated until uh, women's lib as um, uh, the perfect man, revealingly enough. But it doesn't mean the complete human being, in fact. This is what is called in other traditions a realized individual, whatever that means. And a great deal of confusion has arisen because this man or woman is held to have been released from the observance of certain, if not all, conventional forms of human behavior because of having a greater insight into what is really necessary and what isn't. It's roughly comparable to uh, if you know about etiquette, how to behave, you can eat with your hands because you can infringe etiquette, providing you know when and how to do so. This theory on the part of the Sufis has caused an enormous amount of trouble in the past, and a lot of people have become Sufis just in order to get this kind of license, and it's given us a very bad image. 
And indeed, uh, something similar has happened in the West where a certain amount of Puritan conscience lingers. Uh, a number of Western people have, in fact, become what they call Sufis in order to obtain this kind of license and invoke the very long-standing uh, tradition, which is hallowed in literature, that a Sufi may do what he likes. However, this is not really correct in the observance because a Sufi does not infringe the norms of the society in which he lives. He does not find it necessary so to do, although he may understand why they're there and he may not have to obey those norms. Now, uh, in regard to the religious situation of the Sufis, certainly the uh, Sufism has had its being in, in religion and in the Islamic religion, at least in a documented form for a thousand years, its supporters and, and its members believe it to be entirely consistent with the religion of Islam. Uh, this is not to say there have not been a lot of Sufis who were followers of Sufis, such as many followers of Jalaluddin Rumi who were Christians or Jews or nobody knew what they were. And it is the Sufis alone who have formed literary and cultural and even ideological, you might say, religious bridges between Christians and Muslims, between Christians and Muslims and Jews, and between Hindus and Muslims in the historical period in which there were great frictions between those communities. This is all thoroughly documented and there are many literary works of Jewish Sufis, for example, uh, so-called, uh, on record in bibliographies of this sort, or Hindu, uh, the great Hindu teacher Kabir, for example, nobody knows whether he was a Sufi or whether he was a Hindu, and no, many people don't really care. So things can operate on that level. It's not to say, however, that Sufis in general regard themselves as apostates or non-Muslims or something like that. They, they do not. Although some of the Sufis' very greatest men, like Halaj, who was crucified in 922 AD have been accused of apostasy for saying things like, I am the truth. So that is the religious situation of, of the Sufis. It's rather curious. It is said that only Sufis understand the paradoxes involved and that, uh, and I, I do agree with those who say that. And I don't blame those who say that it is absurd of Sufis to say that we belong to this religion, but we will also recognize the members of another religion as having a legitimate stake in this kind of path. However, I do not propose at this late time and in this time of my gray hairs, as it were, to, to sell the past. I, if members of our community have been um, murdered for defending the rights of other religions, I am prepared to stand up and be counted on exactly the same basis. Although it has caused me a very great deal of embarrassment and uh, deprivation over the past few years. So, the Sufi establishes his rule, or his method, or his number of methods. Historically, if you look at the products of these methods, if you look at books which are written, if you read the spin-off from them, you'll find that this rule or method always coincides more or less with the social situation and mentality of the people among whom this Sufi teacher works. And many Sufis are, in fact, not publicly known. Many of them have no students at all, no pupils. And very many of them who teach, unlike teachers in the West, do not want to teach at all. That's because... It is quite a current theory among Sufis that if you want to do something very, very badly, uh, you're not necessarily well motivated for it. You may just be, be obsessed and you may be very bad at it. Therefore, a license to teach, as it were, in Sufism is not something easily come by. The vast number of Sufi schools and the seeming differences between their observances we've already touched on, they're mainly due to two factors. That, Firstly, that the, each teacher may establish what appears to be a separate rule or system, which tends to correspond not only with the f surrounding facts of time and space, but with his own individuality. People differ, and so do the students of a Sufi, because they too are going to be Sufis one day, and so individuality and not processing is the characteristic of Sufism. Now, there's another very interesting thing which I want to tell you about because there has been a lot of misunderstanding about it, and this is in Sufi orders, so-called. There are a number of Sufi orders, as they are called in English. 
They tend to be called paths in tariqa, which means path in Arabic and Persian. And they're very often named after a man, in fact, always a man, I think, yes, who is their putative founder. And in the West, they are generally automatically bracketed, more or less, with the great monastic orders which came into being mostly in the Middle Ages in Western Christendom. Now, in fact, it may interest you to know that although there has been a lot of imitation of these orders and people regard the membership of the order as important and they have penetrated a lot to the West in various forms, we have absolutely no reason to suppose that any one of these orders, which include the Maulavi, Mevlevi order of Jalaldin Rumi, we have no reason to suppose that any one of these orders was ever founded by any of the great teachers whose name it bears. There is no documentation, and indeed from Sufi principles and practices, there is no likelihood that they were, since, since they are mechanical, repetitious, and tend to isolate the Sufis from the general community. And what has almost certainly happened, of course, is that they are secondary stabilizations. When the teacher is dead, the organization can't hold together without institutionalizing his practices because he isn't there anymore. People say to those unregenerate, perhaps, or, or uninstructed uh, successors of his, well, what are we to do? And he, if he can't tell them, they continue to do things that they remember which their master taught them. So, in fact, the Sufi orders, so-called, are not to be considered as legitimate successors of the Sufi teachers in maintaining an infallible rule, as you might call it. Now, I am a member of a number of these orders, and indeed took it in with my mother's milk, as it were. And uh, nevertheless, I must tell you this, that there is a difference between the cultural transmission, the historical facts, and the reality of Sufism, the Sufi training system, and the capacity of the order to produce a Sufi. Now, the Sufi orders, as at present organized and maintained, can uh, continue to produce the 14th century man. And they're extremely interesting because we have vestiges of their litanies. We, we know uh, they, they maintain rule books. They have initiations, which are really most interesting. The whole thing is fascinating from a laboratory point of view, from a museum point of view, from an anthropological point of view, and from a general cultural point of view. Really fascinating. But they do not produce Sufis unless you regard as Sufis people who are pious, very often, religious, very often, people who deny the validity of religion, very often, people who are dedicated people, magnetized around the memory of a acknowledgedly, admittedly great master. If you value these things and you call those Sufism, then these things are Sufi organizations. It's a question of the container and the content. I will yield to nobody in my respect for the Sufi masters of, of the past, but I have a duty towards them, and this duty includes not worshipping them, not mimicking them, but trying to obtain, to hold, and to transmit that which they obtained, held, and transmitted. And this is a really very serious and important thing which is very, very seldom discussed, hardly ever noticed, but the information about it is available in books written both before I was born and since I was born, <laughs> the ones since I was born, not by me. It uh, really should be clarified, because until that is got out of the way, or until the perspective is understood, that these vestiges are of historical and cultural interest, but not of spiritual, dynamic, or Sufi developmental capacity, depending on your terminology, then for so long will they remain unable to discharge a higher function. The most important thing I have to say, I think, who knows when we may meet again, is Sufism is not the adopting of mimetic patterns. It's not even a religious conversion. It is grounded in a certain sort of attunement to something which is beyond our customary limitations. This thing 
is, I insist, rendered both in psychological and terms of psychology and physics, and also in divine terms, in religious terms, as to whether we will be able to benefit from it and or contribute to it. A lot depends on our sincerity. Sincerity is very difficult to establish, very difficult to recognize, very difficult to maintain. It is best maintained not by adopting a, a sentimental posture, but by adopting a fair, honest and straightforward posture, a posture of measurement, if you like, rather than of emotional depths. The Sufi preparation, which anybody can do in this culture, will involve familiarizing oneself with what is currently available about Sufism and, if one has to, joining all the lunatics who are running various cults, or if one doesn't have to, understanding a little more about what other people are doing who may also be lunatics, or who may not. The study materials for this purpose are easily available. You won't get any more from a Sufi master or from a face-to-face -face confrontation with a representative of Sufism unless you have already yourself done something about it. And this involves an examination of Sufi thought, practice, and writings already available to you. Well, it's an old Sufi story, I suppose some of you may know it, about a man was walking along and he he saw a stone in the road and the stone said on it, there was written on the stone, turn me over and read. And he turned the stone over and it said underneath, written on the stone, why do you want to know more when you have not made any use of what you know already? Jalaldin Rumi wrote about this, about how people are not just inert lumps of wood whom we or anybody else processes, whittles, turns into something, but there is that there is something incumbent on you to do about yourself. If you don't do it, you remain like some sort of an insect or an animal, he says. That is to say, you have these characteristics of this kind of thing. And he said, I think, I don't think I'll read it in Persian, I'll tell you what he says in English. He says, two insects eat from the same place. From one you get a sting, and from the other one you get honey. Two kinds of deer have the same grazing and they drink the same water. But from one we get dung and the other musk. Each of two kinds of cane feeds from one thing. But this one is empty and the other is full of sugar. I do tell you quite honestly that you will not find Sufism hard to understand. You will not find it hard to find. You will not find it mystifying and difficult if you do something other than adopting a posture of sincerity or greed, that is to say, pretending you're very keen on something to yourself or desiring it too much, you can find this thing. It cannot, in fact, be withheld from you if you really have the kind of attitude towards it that attracts it to you. That's a very difficult thing for us to, um, to render in terms which don't sound dreadfully banal or which don't sound mawkishly religious. So we are living in a difficult time. But it can be done. It is being done by people and it is actually worth doing, more particularly because it doesn't really occupy as much of your time and effort as you might think. Not that I'm trying to sell it to you, but the great woman Sufi Rabia al Adawiyah said in a prayer, O oh God, if I worship you from Desire for paradise, exclude me from paradise. And if I worship you from fear of hell, throw me into hell.